Why do we worry about diabetes and coronary artery disease? Well, the whole business is about atherothrombosis, atherosclerosis. This is a pretty self-explanatory graphic where you can see there's so many complex things going on at one point in time to a different point in time as you go along the line. And uh, you only need to look at one end of the spectrum to the other to try and get uh, to see what, you know, uh, personally, I do not believe in, in the term called pre-diabetes because, you know, you're either a diabetic or you're not. So I think that should, should be going off pretty soon, you know, in, in years to come. Um, because the long-term outcome perhaps would be uh, the same in terms of if you really have to worry about people. And that is actually the biggest iceberg which is sitting behind the ocean uh, with so many people uh, carrying a risk but not knowing it. However, to put that in context, you know, this is just a graphic showing you what sort of um, issues uh, the body, the vessels have to go through with time in order to 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 get to a point where you know something might go horribly wrong and somebody could have a non-fatal or a fatal cardiovascular event um it's a complex uh, syndrome um like any chronic disease cancer for example and uh, um these are pretty much uh, well known to everyone, but why do we worry? Because we need to treat so many factors in, in, in a diabetic patient with coronary artery disease, because th there's so much going on, ranging from um, not just glycemic control, you know, to the lip lipid aspects, inflammatory aspects, uh, the dysfunction of the endothelium and the microvasculature, um, the actual obstruction, which may be there, uh, along with spasm or microvascular symptoms. And of course, if, if, if you've exhausted all the options, then, then treating them differently. Um, and, and that's true about, you would have seen uh, hundreds and hundreds of diabetic patients with coronary disease, sometimes coming back to you with recurrent symptoms and not, uh, not happy with their quality of life. Um, but we know more about things and how to handle all that. Um, and the science around this is continuing to evolve as, 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 as I speak. So uh, this is perhaps uh, uh, just a, a summary. Um, now, the goalposts keep changing. And this is the one from 2021 from European Society of Cardiology in terms of diabetes and cardiovascular risk. And, and you can see that, you know, there's nothing called low risk. You know, if you're diabetic, you at least have a moderate to high or very high risk. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't dwell any further on this, but uh, it's it just a snapshot of how by simply having that label, um, even if you're under 10 years with or without, well, without any target organ disease, and no additional cardiovascular risk factors, you still have a moderate risk, a moderate risk uh, to be handled, uh, let alone um, the duration and let alone uh, with established uh, atherosclerotic disease. Uh, the key challenge is because I work on both sides of the continent, I've got people uh, in, in care, uh, under my care in India, as well as here. Um, I run a big charity uh, for cardiac patients. So, I, I learned, I keep learning interesting perspectives and I'll show you a case from this morning about two hours ago. Every Friday I do a clinic, um, um, of course, virtually uh, and every few months in person uh, for my charity. And uh, what I've learned, you know, which would perhaps uh, resonate with um, the audience uh, which is listening to this, that we see much, much younger ages um, to the, the, the spread is quite, quite broad. Um, there's pretty much discrepancy in levels and type of care. Um, yes, we are able to reduce the mortality burden uh, provided the person can get timely intervention or timely treatment. We can't really define, we don't really know what's going on in rural, semi-urban, or sometimes urban areas uh, where morbidity, mortality burden can be quite high. 
we don't have a national coronary artery disease register in India. Um, if you diagnose somebody to have CAD, you know, they don't go on a, on a national database. Um, we over and under use medications, especially dual antiplatelets, uh, dose of statins. We don't optimize the use of the modern medications for um, um, uh, coronary disease in diabetes or at risk of diabetes or so on and so forth. We over and under use coronary vascularization um, and, and, uh, uh, and you can have your own view about it. Uh, maybe we may not be spending enough time with people um, about shared decision making and multiple opinions. You know, that's, you know, you, you ask me, I mean, the patient I, I've consulted today has been through four different centers. Um, and, and that adds to the delays in prognostic treatment, non-prognostic treatment, uh, or non-guidance directed treatment, so on and so forth. So these are some of the, you know, it's not a comprehensive list, but you can keep adding to it. This is a case, you can see the screen on the left side, there's, there, there is an electro lead electrocardiogram. On the right side, there is a coronary angiogram. This is a 55 year old male I consulted this morning who's been to three or four hospitals. Uh, about uh, two and a half months ago, um, he's a diabetic, wasn't uh, or isn't uh, properly um, managed. Uh, there aren't any other reversible factors. Um, BMI seems to be reasonable. He had a classic anterior STEMI delayed presentation after about two days from one nursing home to another where he could not be thrombolized. Of course, he didn't have primary angioplasty. Uh, eventually, he landed in a, in a, in a, in a government center um, where he had seven or eight days of stay, uh, during which he had an elective cath, which revealed a tight um, LAD stenosis. Uh, as you can see, perhaps um, uh, on the right side of the screen, he was advised a stent to LAD or a PCI to LAD uh, with an LV ejection fraction of 30% without any obvious uh, consideration to the infarct related territory and perhaps uh, loss of uh, viable myocardium in that territory. And he was eventually discharged on a small dose of beta blocker, uh, a small dose of a statin, dual therapy, um, a small dose of ACE inhibitor and a nitrate. And you can keep on guessing what all you could add to him to for his prognosis as well as uh, perhaps um, um, quality of life and symptoms going forward. So um, eventually, you know, you can think of and ask me the questions what I did to him, uh, but I'm sure the answers are pretty much self-explanatory. Um, the silent myocardial ischemia, I'd like to just briefly mention it because this has been dealt with in the past quite aggressively as to, you know, about two thirds of ischemic episodes uh, in somebody would be um, asymptomatic. And uh, it may or may not cause some symptoms. You might, you might be able to find something on ECG. You might be able to find something if you do a, a thallium scan or a stress echocardiogram. Uh, it has, it's, but it, it was thought to be impacting prognosis. There was a proper classification and initial studies, you know, hinted that revascularization could be better, but then it's all been overtaken by the ischemia trials, as you would perhaps refer to for those with interest in cardiology would know that the ischemia study completely kind of decimated this fact that if you offer them revascularization, they do better No, Well, about 30% of the population of 5,000 people in the randomized setting um, were uh, asymptomatic and 40% of the total patients in the ischemia trial uh, were uh, diabetics with no benefit whatsoever in terms of symptoms or, I mean, the symptoms why there was some benefit in people with daily angina, but otherwise there was no prognostic benefits um, um, or hard endpoints in people who were offered initial invasive treatment. So um, in the elective setting, I think we need to see what symptoms they have, what is the grade of symptoms, um, what is the glycemic control? Uh, how are the other organs functioning as a holistic physician? And this is exactly what I said in the Apicon. Um, I was honored with uh, the V. Parameshwara uh, um, oration in Jaipur a few months ago. And, and my main emphasis and main, main learnings which I shared was that we just don't want to look at diabetes 
CAD, you know, we want to look at everything and then make a decision. Uh, we must know the functional aspects of the, um, of the cardiac system. We should know a bit more about the anatomy, if not by one test, then maybe two tests if possible, um, whether they're unstable, what's been their timeline, um, where, do, where do they fall in the natural history? And, um, and we should keep in mind that females in particular, you know, poorly controlled hypertensives, a lot of diabetics, you know, the most common cause of angina is not obstructive coronary artery disease, but it is microvascular angina. And uh, you can simply treat that medically. You don't have to really bring them to the cat lab uh, and also have a plan in place for refractory symptoms should they come back to you having had all sorts of treatments um, and, and still, still not happy with their effort tolerance. These are just uh, the usual pictures you would have seen um, over your uh, you know, uh, last couple of years. Um, we have these fantastic imaging techniques available now at different uh, centers all around. And, and we are using them, maybe overusing them, underusing them, depending on where we live, where we work, so on and so forth. Uh, this particular uh, slide is about CT scan and how CT scan has transformed investigative cardiology from a coronary artery and anatomy, uh, and also structural perspective. Um, also, we could do CT guided invasive angiography and make important decisions. I see that this, this, this CT scan shows you a lesion in the LAD here, um, um, uh, which has been confirmed on this invasive angiogram, which was picked up uh, on, on, on the non-invasive test here. And you can combine some stress protocols as well. Um, you can do some advanced functional imaging combining with CT scans. Uh, but I think um, if you really have to think like a novice, you know, a simple thallium scan done properly um, or a stress echocardiogram can give you as much information combined with some basic anatomy. If you really had to assess somebody as to how far you really want to go with that. And that's a cardiac MRI. It's not universally available. We don't want to use it unless it's really necessary. And I don't want to dwell upon it too much in the context of diabetic coronary artery disease. This is not something we need in every single case. No, this is just give, it's, this just sometimes affirms our position in, in where we want to really take complex decisions in a more like MDT setting when we would refer to it. So I wouldn't, this is a completely separate topic for discussion. Um, acute coronary syndromes. Well, this is a pretty much summary slide from 2015 that. If you have ACS patients, and if you randomly went on checking sugars, you know you might find that up to two thirds would have you know abnormal glycemia, uh, and that is no surprise. Um, ACS considerations uh, over our practice or my practice over two continents actually that you could have you know different symptoms. You might not have the classic chest pain. You may have a normal ECG. Of course, we know ECG can be normal in up to half patients. Your biomarkers maybe may not be elevated. Uh, so don't just rely on everything. Just look at the patient properly. Um, focus on glycemic management. Try and intensify the statin. And where you think it's really relevant, go for an early invasive approach if it's available, if it's affordable for the patient and make sure you use the pharmacology properly. And we have evidence to support that people who are high risk can be given up to two years extra beyond 12 months of um, a dual antiplatelet therapy um, where there are exceptional reasons. Otherwise, there's pretty much no role of carrying on beyond. And this has been uh, further, further dissected in the recently concluded ESC meeting that in the future, we might be stopping things much sooner then 12 months actually, maybe three months, six months, um, and, and just continuing with some monotherapy. And perhaps the clopidogrel might be better uh, than aspirin, but the world, again, as I said, is changing uh, with uh, as the science continues to evolve and give us more perspectives. Uh, a stop, there's nothing wrong with stopping if you're not sure what to do. And again, rehabilitation, preparing patients to go and have the right treatment, and then having the right rehab after what they've had. Um, what to expect in the cat lab? If you bring somebody to the lab, um, you know, this is just a list. 
But then colleagues with interest in cardiology would have seen everything and anything, to be honest. You can expect diffuse disease. You can expect access issues in vasculopathic um, um, profiles. You can have small vessel disease, branch disease. Often you want to stop and discuss um, you know, drug eluting stents of the default. You always want to do ischemia driven treatment rather than treatment based on angiographic appearances. And uh, you want to minimize the contrast load and focus on hypoglycemic management. These are just some of the snapshots of uh, what sort of things you can see in the cat lab, uh, what sort of diffuseness of the um, nature of disease in diabetic patients where, where you sometimes scratch your head and think, what do I do um, to try and, and get this person the best option? We often refer to MDT uh, meetings, and this is a slide showing you occluded crafts in a patient with CABG quite a few years ago. No surprises. Now, I would like to spend just uh, um, uh, uh, just a few seconds on, on, on this ischemia trials, which the diabetes subset did not show any benefit with initial invasive treatment. It is important take home message for, for the colleagues here who have not been uh, familiar with this, um, this, these trials because they have really changed the whole landscape of how we are re offering REVASC to elective patients with um, often triple vessel disease with moderate to severe ischemia on functional testing uh, or no symptoms, so on and so forth, uh, and having an MDT approach. So on the left side, you've got what was 2019, that is now, you can see that there's hardly anything green except for left main disease and a left ventricular systolic dysfunction to be labeled as significantly impaired. Those are the only class one indications where you would, in stable ischemic heart disease, you would try and offer something more than medical management. Otherwise you will try and medicate, 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 and carry on optimizing risk factors until you feel it's no longer working. And this is where comes our heart team concept, where we try and, or you try and sit down with everyone who matters and make a concerted decision. Uh, I would like to end my talk with this, because this is what's kind of taken the world by storm. And we are not, we, 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 are, we, we are discharging every single patient from our hospital now as the default practice who has LV dysfunction on admission uh, or new LV dysfunction diagnosed or pre-existing on an SGL2 inhibitor by default, uh, and, and then leaving them to be followed up in the community if they qualify for the treatment. Now, GLP-1 antagonists, uh, sorry, agonists, uh, you know, it's a completely separate area for discussion in a different forum, but I just thought I'll end up with slide because there's more evidence to come. You know, we've got this um, uh, very interesting combination studies coming out and uh, the general principles from 2020 uh, have now perhaps are now taking a little backseat and uh, trying to go more towards where we think we are now. And these, this is a paper from August and exactly we had similar discussions in our ESC 2022 meeting just a few weeks ago that tailored the treatment. You know, it's not just about everything else plus an SGL2 or a GLP1A with or without combination, well, time will tell. Perhaps very soon we'll know that. Thank you very much.